Thanks for joining us for CBN's On the Home Front, where we highlight what the men and women of America's military do to defend our country. I'm Mark Martin. This week marks an important anniversary in America's military history. During World War II on June 6, 1944, also known as D-Day, more than 150,000 American, British and Canadian forces landed on five beaches along a 50-mile stretch of the heavily fortified coast of France's Normandy region. Future President and Supreme Commander of Allied Expeditionary Forces Dwight D. Eisenhower gave a speech to U.S. soldiers the day before the invasion. This video commemorates the anniversary. Soldiers, sailors and airmen of the Allied Expeditionary Force, you are about to embark upon the great crusade toward which we have striven these many months. The eyes of the world are upon you. The hopes and prayers of liberty-loving people everywhere march with you. In company with our brave allies and brothers in arms on other fronts, you will bring about the destruction of the German war machine, the elimination of Nazi tyranny over the oppressed peoples of Europe, and security for ourselves in a free world. Your task will not be an easy one. Your enemy is well-trained, well-equipped, and battle-hardened. He will fight savagely. But this is the year 1944. Much has happened since the Nazi triumphs of 1940-41. The United Nations have inflicted upon the Germans great defeat in open battle, man to man. Our air offensive has seriously reduced their strength in the air and their capacity to wage war on the ground. Our home front have given us an overwhelming superiority in weapons and munitions of war and placed at our disposal great reserves of trained fighting men. The tide has turned. The free men of the world are marching together to victory. I have full confidence in your courage, devotion to duty, and skill in battle. We will accept nothing less than full victory. Good luck, and let us all beseech the blessing of Almighty God upon this great and noble undertaking. D-Day was a crucial day in World War II. The 315th and 437th airlift wings at Joint Base Charleston played a part in it all. They give us a look back at the historic day. Soldiers, sailors, and airmen of the Allied Expeditionary Force, you are about to embark upon the Great Crusade. The eyes of the world are upon you. Flash, London, Eisenhower's headquarters announces Allies land in France. Bulletin. Supreme Headquarters, Allied Expeditionary Force, June 6 AP. General Dwight D. Eisenhower's headquarters announced today that Allied troops began landing on the northern coast of France this morning, strongly supporting... D-Day was actually called Operation Neptune, and so it re they required about 6,000 naval vessels, about 160,000 men, and the plan was to actually capture a 50-mile stretch of beach along the Normandy coast in, in northern France. It was called the 437th Troop Carrier Group. We had four flying squadrons. We were called troop carrier groups at the time because the primary purpose of these C-47s that we flew was to bring troops into combat. Our objective was to get paratroopers behind enemy lines. The 85th was taken and put on loan to the 436th Troop Carrier Group at another base in England. When they went over there, they became attached to another unit that was the first wave of the aerial assault of D-Day. And our brethren from the 315th, they were in that first wave as well. So that first wave took off and they had the 101st Airborne Division and they were going to have paratroopers jump out the side of their airplane. The 315th Troop Carrier Groups and then their Troop Carrier Squadrons, they were vital to the entire thing. Without them, General Ridgeway and, and the command staff, the 82nd, would never even made it to the ground. A couple hours after that wave of airplanes took off, the next group, which the 437 Troop Carrier Group was part of, we were going to tow gliders, and these are non-powered gliders. The concept is that we would fly in, release the gliders. The gliders had predetermined landing zones. They would land these airplanes, these gliders, uh, and everybody would just climb right out or drive the jeeps out the back. So for the 437 Troop Carrier Group, when we took off with our three squadrons, we had 52 airplanes launch on that morning. 
Footage from the invasions of Normandy are some of the most captivating visuals from the war. And that's because General Eisenhower wanted to document it all for newsreels and military archives. So he created a combat motion picture coverage unit. American film director and cinematographer George Stevens was assigned to take charge. While documenting the Allied forces' advance toward Berlin, he also shot a personal visual diary of the war. The images captured later provided a collection that remains the main historical record of World War II. George Stevens Jr., after his father's death, took the best of his father's color film and in 1994 produced a documentary entitled George Stevens' D-Day to Berlin on his father's life and the war. The color journal starts on D-Day and follows the filmmaker and his unit across Europe. Stevens says his father's job became more important than he could have predicted. And they drove down and they went into Dachau, uh, the concentration camp. And nobody had anticipated what they were going to find there. And of course, it was this harrowing sight of these emaciated uh, prisoners and typhus and disease and dead bodies in, stacked like cordwood. And as the head of this unit, he realized that now things had changed rather than just being a recorder of events, he became a gatherer of evidence. And while troops were on the front lines and all of America was watching and waiting, one man in particular was waiting to hear of its success. Walter Monk shares how he helped prepare for the invasion and how his wave prediction method was crucial to the troops' landings. My name is Walter Monk, M-U-N-K, and I'm a professor of oceanography at Scripps and have been here since for over 70 years. I have a special chair endowed by the Secretary of the Navy and have held that chair for about 30 years. And the first Allied initiative in fighting back was to be a amphibious landing in Northwest Africa and I was working in the Pentagon and learned about uh, practice landings in Carolina being carried out with new kinds of landing craft named LCBPs, landing craft vehicle and personnel, boats that would come into the to the beach and then drop the bow and people would uh, run out of the bow onto the beach and establish a beachhead and learned that and found that uh, that when the waves exceeded five feet height that the landing craft would broach turn parallel to the beach, waves would break into the landing craft. People would get hurt, and exercise would be secured, waiting for a day with calmer conditions. And I went back to find out about typical wave heights in Northwest Africa in winter, and found they exceeded six feet. And I wondered what would happen if, under those conditions, and I asked my commanding officer about that, and he, he told me to just forget about it because he was sure that the authorities had considered that and I should do what I was told. I was 25 and had no reputation and no background, very junior, but I didn't. I couldn't quite forget about it, so I telephoned Harald Sverup, whom I had met for two summers, who had become my teacher, and begged him to come out. And he very kindly took the next flight, and we sat together for about a month in the Pentagon to try and figure out how we could predict waves so one could pick 
a relatively calm day for the exercise. It seemed like the only possible solution. And after months we were satisfied that this could be done. And Harold Sverdup had a major reputation in the world. They listened to him. And uh, we were permitted to participate in the planning and to, and to pick and to predict the waves at the landing beaches and to pick a relatively calm two days. And the landings took place under relatively good conditions. After the break, we'll hear another incredible story of one veteran's journey during World War II. Welcome back to On the Home Front. Dale Jones enlisted in the U.S. Army in September 1940, a full year before American involvement in World War II. He served across two continents during the war as a member of the 1st Armored Division. He shares his incredible story of service and sacrifice. We came into the mouth of the Mediterranean about five or ten miles out away from land, there's a big explosion. You've never seen so many GIs in the water that all your life. And we went as fast as we could, and we picked up as many as we could. We headed, we headed for Oran, Algiers, in the Mediterranean. We got rid of all the Germans, I guess, and we headed back over through Algiers, over the mountain, and we come down, and we was in Tunisia. When units of the 1st Armored came ashore at Oran in northern Tunisia, November 8, 1942, to challenge the Nazis' hold on North Africa. The British were there first, and they cleaned the enemy out of Egypt and Libya, and here both, both armies are fighting and the Germans are in the middle. Our objective was to hold Castrine Pass. There was two passes, Fayed Pass and Castrine Pass. Well, they snuck around Fayed Pass and, and cut us down. We got chewed up pretty bad. We landed on Anzio Beach. And from what, what I've learned, we got within 15 miles of Rome before the Germans found out and they shoved us back within, you know, 15 miles around from any corner of the, where the, the, and Joe Beach was. Every major battle, we defeated, we defeated the Germans, and on up the boot, one of the majors hollered at me. He said, Jones, he said, we want you to get in that plane. You're going back to Naples. You're going home. He was in the Marines. And he's the one that never come back. He got killed on Okinawa because they were shooting at the this way and they come back they come back around on the side of him and they had to reverse they had to turn themselves and yeah, what I understand is that the major the major said that your brother was shot twice in the neck, you know, two shells. Said he never knew what hit him. And that's, that makes me feel good.
Even today, troops are still preparing for any and all scenarios that could lead to war, especially at Joint Base Pearl Harbor Hickam, which saw one of the worst attacks on American troops during the war. The Center for Security Forces trains sailors with academic curriculum in the classroom and practical hands-on training in the field. So our mission here is to train the sailors. Our mission is to make sure that the fleet is ready to respond to any threat, whether it be a, a terrorist attack, whether it be an active shooter, whether it be a threat within the ship. We train our sailors here to go back to the fleet and be able to protect the fleet. You serve with these people every day and you would never want to see someone that you work with get hurt or you know, even worse, lose their life. So it's just very important to me to like actually be able to protect them. I feel like if I went to the ship now and something were to happen, um, I wouldn't even hesitate to respond just with the knowledge that I have now after doing this course. Um, definitely a lot more confident in my tactical skills and just being able to assess problems. I just came from a ship. I was there for four years. The most rewarding part for me was seeing sailors that came through this training, whether it be here in Pearl Harbor or any of our other learning sites, coming back to the ship with the wealth of knowledge that we can provide them and being able to help out the ship and help out the training teams and make us all better. Don't go anywhere. We'll be back right after the break. Welcome back. For some World War II veterans, their journey did not end when the war did. A 96-year-old veteran airman has formed a special friendship with an Air Force Reserve First Sergeant centered around a 70-year-old biplane. These two airmen shared their stories about how this aircraft shaped their merging destinies. It's sort of like riding in a uh, Lincoln Continental with a top down. Very smooth ride, or riding a motorcycle uh, in the sky. So you have the breeze blowing on you, and it's a very different experience. Well, actually, my first airplane ride was in a Stearman, and it was blue and yellow. It was an Army Air Corps Stearman, and the gentleman that was flying it had flown in World War II, learned to fly in a Stearman, uh, flew B-29s during the war. Well, as a child, I drove up and down the road with my parents, and I was in the back seat of the car, and I would see the billboards on the road, and I kept pointing that out to my parents. Look, they have dog fights there. And it wasn't until I went out there with the Boy Scouts uh, when I was 14, it was my first exposure to seeing the show. And uh, I feel very lucky that I lived within 15 miles of a very unique place like the Flying Circus where I could actually go there. Uh, so when I was in college in ROTC, uh, I set my sights on becoming a pilot. But then I found out that uh, they required better eyesight than I had at that time. You know, after uh, not being able to fly in the Air Force, I did not let that discourage me. So I pursued getting my commercial license, a flight instructor rating, and began to pursue uh, commercial aviation. And I got a loan, uh, bought the airplane, and immediately started using it in air shows uh, and flying passenger rides, uh, you know, for hire in the airplane. Hey, how you doing, sir? Can I have a hug? Because <laughs> you're a big guy. Yeah, that's what you tell me every time. I used to be tall. I've been Air Force all my life, so I'm a retired Air Force guy. And uh, my dad didn't approve of flying, but he was infantry. I went to school at West Point. One of my classmates is the great Robin Olds. And Olds and I were in the same squadron, and both of us were made flight leaders. And most of the flying we did was escorting bombers 
all over Germany. And so I lost my right engine and uh, put on fire. I felt the heat, could see the glare. So I thought I'd better get out of the airplane before it burns up. There was forest and brush up ahead, but I got it slid on the ground sooner than that, and it held together. They found me, and when they found me, they pointed their guns at me, and one of them said, For youth, the far is over. Put up your hands. <laughs> I guess seven or eight years ago, I was speaking with Al Tucker's daughter, and she was working in our uh, snack bar out at the Flying Circus. And she pointed at my steerman and she said, you know, my father flew and trained in one of those in World War II. And I said, oh, really? I'd like to talk to him. And she says, well, I'll bring him out. So a few weeks later, uh, he came out and I met him. So we shook hands. And Dave asked me if I had ever flown that airplane before, and I said, I, yeah, it was the first airplane I ever flew. Yeah. Would you like to fly it again? I said, I sure would. Come on. He discovered I could fly it. Dave and I have been flying together ever since. I've flown several World War II pilots in, in the aircraft that had learned to fly in it. And that's always a joy for those of us that are maintaining these airplanes. And I really see it as, I'm just a caretaker of it, then I'll pass it on to some other, other pilot and uh, he can continue to, to maintain it and share it with everyone. Flying was his life in, in the military. He, he's told me stories about all the different aircraft he's flown. and and there's never any regrets. But I don't think uh, as a pilot we really ever retire from the feeling and the, uh, the love that we have for aviation. It's just, uh, it's in his blood, I think, just like all of us. That's all for today, but you can always find more of our exclusive news coverage at cbnnews.com. Hope you'll join us next time. Have a great day.